All right. Well, good morning again. Good morning. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. And welcome to our humble little church here in uh, Tarpon Springs. How'd you put it, Mark? It's, it's the Tarpon Springs branch of the Palm Harbor Church. The Tarpon Springs, Springs branch of the Palm Harbor Church. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. We got to open more branches. Yeah. I guess that makes me the branch manager. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, the inspiration for this sermon came from two places. One was Susan and I went to ASI recently, and it was amazing. There was uh, 210 vendors there, 210 vendors. We had 720 minutes to visit all 10 of the, or 210 of those vendors. We had about three minutes and 49 seconds with each vendor. If you really were to calculate it out that way, that's all you would have. Now, there were obviously a lot of them that we weren't going to go to. Several of them weren't there. Um, but I thought about this idea of um, somebody asked me, oh, we were talking once about where we were from, and, and I said, I'm a, I'm, I'm a Russian. And they said, you're Russian? I said, yes, always Russian here and Russian there and Russian everywhere. You know, that makes me a Russian. And um, um, when I looked around and I saw like all the, the, uh, the seminars and workshops that went on and the speakers and these 210 vendors that were there and uh, it, was, it was like this little beehive inside the vendor hall and people just running back and forth, going from one to another. And then it was almost like if you study fractals in mathematics, it was almost like this fractal experience. And then each of the vendors, they were to and fro back and forth to different places. We, we were um, helping to support ministries from um, uh, front, Advent, Adventist Frontier Missions. And when we, we got there, I got an email from this couple. I didn't really know who they were. I couldn't remember. But apparently we were helping out with supporting some ministry in Greenland. And it was this young couple. Where were they from? So do you remember? Somewhere in Africa. Yeah, I think originally Kenya. Kenya, that's right. And, and they told us this amazing story how they went to Greenland. And they're the first um, black people that many in Greenland had ever seen. And they said they looked at us like we were from another planet. And, and she said it was amazing. And, and this such an open door, they said, because everyone was like smiling at them, trying to get their attention. Yeah. And, and just hugged them and held on to them. And open door, it's been clean for them. So this is, yeah, this is a couple from Africa that will now be spending eight years living in Greenland, not Iceland, which is the nice place, right? You know the story? They call Iceland, Iceland, and Greenland, Greenland, because the Nordics didn't want people visiting um, um, Iceland or Greenland, so the nice place, so they called it Iceland, and instead they wanted them to come to the bad place, which was Greenland. Uh, there's a, the population's like 49,000. The city they live in is 19,000 people. There's three stoplights, and they're going to be having a ministry there for eight years, wow. coming from warm, hot, temperate, tropical climates, going to somewhere where the average annual temperature is the high, average high is 52 degrees. Wow. On the water with the winds and all that. <laughs> and there was everybody else that we met. There were, then, there were ministries there from all over the world. And this whole idea of there were technology ministries. There was one I met there. I'm going to hook up with us, and they're going to come and help us to learn how to live stream our services and our seminars that we do. There were there those that had uh, a lot of technology with regard to um, uh, communications. There was a, a big van there that had satellite dishes on it, and they drive around, and, and they can broadcast anywhere in the world, and 3ABN, and and some of the other ministries that are involved, it was just amazing to me. The, the difference between when I came into the church in 1992, and I went to my first um, prophecy seminar, it was all done with projectors and 35 millimeter slides. And if you wanted to change a slide, you had to do it six weeks in advance. Well, that's how it used to be. When I would speak at conferences, 
I'd have to get these slides together and have them ready six weeks. Now, I change it the morning that I'm going to present. I go to go up there and they go, okay, we got your presentation loaded. And I'm like, yeah, well, that ship has sailed. And I've now changed the presentation to something uh, completely different. You know, I forgot, I forgot to ask for prayer for Anthony. And I was remiss in that. Anthony, are you okay? He was involved in an automobile accident. So I would ask you to please, if you will, to keep Anthony and Rachel and the kids in your prayers this week. I'm glad to see you up and about and that you're here. Yeah. Well, we're grateful that you're here and that you're alive and, and well, my friend. All right, Daniel 12, 4 reads this. But you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret. Seal up the book until the end of time, or the, until the time of the end, when many will rush here and there, and knowledge will increase. Now, we're going to take this apart a little bit. But let's expand this a bit into the bigger picture. Let us have prayer first. Dear Lord, so grateful again for the opportunity to come before you today and to speak God's words, not mine, Lord. I would ask that the Holy Spirit would be ever-present in each of our hearts, and every word spoken here today would be words from on high. I ask that you bless our little church and our time together. I pray in your precious name. Amen. So let's get the context starting from Daniel 12.1. It says, At that time, Michael the archangel, who stands guard over your nation, will arise. Then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since the nations first came into existence. You hear that? My question is, are we going to be surprised when that happens? Of course we're not, right? Like it's some strange thing because we're expecting this to happen. The Bible tells us in advance that this is what's going to happen. But at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky, and those who, lead, those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. But you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret, right? Must have been hard for him to do. Um, I think it was Benjamin Franklin said that three people can keep a secret as long as two of them are dead. <laughs> keep this prophecy a secret, seal up the book until the time of the end, when many will rush here and there, it says to and fro in some translations, and knowledge will increase. So the first thing I want to ask is, what does it mean to, to wander to and fro, right? That's the first, because we read a lot of things in the Bible and we just pass over them. Oh, the Bible says people are going to wander to and fro. What does that even mean, okay? Well, Amos, I love the book of Amos, 8, 11 through 12 says, the time is surely coming, says the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Do you hear this? When the Holy Spirit is withdrawn, there will be a famine on the earth of hearing the word of God. There will come a time of persecution that we will no longer be able to meet freely in our churches to preach the word of God to people either in our churches, in our homes, or on the streets. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from border to border, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. So let's be careful in understanding the context here. People will go to and fro. We're going to talk about that because the idea of travel has increased and people wandering the planet has increased and our ability to go places has increased. But remember that much of this is because people are searching for something to satisfy them, to fill the God hole in their lives. They're traveling all over the world and visiting every continent and climbing every mountain and going to every resort that there is because they're lacking something and they have a God hole. They lack the spiritual connection with the Holy Spirit. And when the Bible talks about wandering to and fro, it's not just talking about the technology of travel. It's saying that people are doing this because they're searching for something that they can't find. And that is searching for the word of God. Let's look at America's travel patterns. In the late 19th century, 
the primary travel was by train, horse, and buggy. People rarely traveled more than a dozen miles from their home. I love that idea. I'd never leave home if I didn't have to. <clears throat> I love just being there. Early in the 20th century, right in the early 1900s, we started to see the mass production of automobiles. We also saw air travel begin at that time. And the average miles traveled for people went from about a dozen miles a year to about 3,000 miles per year. In the mid-20th century, we saw the development of the interstate highway system. You know, I just read somewhere that somebody has proposed a driving tunnel from here to Europe. Who wants to be underneath the ocean in a vehicle driving to Europe and have some kind of an accident or an explosion or something occur? And it takes so long they have to have little rest stops and hotels and everything along the way so that people can stop. And they even now propose that we could do that to Hawaii. Have a tunnel where we could drive to Hawaii. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's that? 50 years to build. Another 50 to rebuild. <laughs> right? Mid-20th century, the highway system, average miles traveled increased to about 10,000 miles per year. And then what happened today is with international travel and changes in the international markets, the average miles traveled increased to 17,000 miles per year. Now, I know that doesn't sound like much because many of us put that on our cars per year. But this is talking about the entire, everyone and all the travel that people are, are involved in over that particular period of time. What was the joke? Guy got stopped by the cop, he was doing 80 miles an hour, and he said, that's ridiculous, I haven't been driving for an hour, right? So you have to sort of take it with a grain of salt as to what those numbers <laughs> might mean. But the idea is, is that people are all over the place. Now, you can go anywhere you want. On, Susan and I were looking at this, we got this brochure on cruises, and we're looking at the brochure on cruises, okay? And do you know that what the entire focus of the brochure was? It wasn't the places you went, it wasn't the, the shore excursions, it wasn't visiting the ancient ruins of Rome or going to Tunisia or what, Madagascar, all the great things you could get. To. You know what the whole entire brochure focused on? Food and alcohol. That was it. And get well, but even the that it, it was just the food and the drink on there. And Tim, if I recall right, if we look historically, the collapse of almost every great civilization was preceded by all, the, all those uh, vices of pleasure. That's right. A focus on food and drink was it was a big um, a big part of it. Well. Has knowledge increased? Yes. Let's go into ChatGPT and ask it and see what it says. In 1984, only 8% of households had computers. In fact, it was just before that, I believe in 78, that the president of IBM came out and he said how ridiculous it was that only three or four households in the entire world would ever own a personal computer, that people had no use for them, and there was no reason to produce them. By 2000, that number increased to 51%. So in 2000, half of all households had a computer. In 2018, more than 75% of American households. I thought it would have been higher than that, actually. But this is based on surveys or studies that are done. And today, with you have smartphones and tablets, it's almost 100% of people have some form of computer. There is more computing power in this little junky Android piece of junk phone that I have than they use to get to the moon. In fact, um, when they went to the moon for the first time, they did it using a little, I think it was an 
NS 600 slide rule is what they did many, much of their calculations on. Now with access to AI, including chatbots and large language modules, um, this has significantly increased our ability, as they say, to leave no stone unturned, to leave no one behind. And I have this little thing I say, like when I'm the grandkids and they ask a question, I say, no question should go unanswered anymore. And you just pick up Google and you say, what's the tallest building in North America? Or what's the highest mountain in South America? Or whatever I want to know, no question should be unanswered. And if you look here, what this diagram is showing you is this sort of ge geometric growth in knowledge. So where, where we doubled um, the knowledge every 25 years, is that's what that's saying. Every 25 years, the, the knowledge we had doubled. And you can see now it's every 13 months. What was the rule that, I can't remember who it was, but it was the guy who ran Intel. And he said every two years, computing power doubles. And now they've changed that to where it's even more often. How about medical knowledge? Has our medical knowledge increased? Uh, I'm not saying all this is, uh, is for good, by the way. I did want to mention something about the, the increase in the travel patterns. What that does is it separates us further from each other, right? People now travel further and they go more places. And what it does is it weakens the personal relationships. You know, if you watch any of these documentaries about how lions, for example, in, the, in Africa or in, or in Asia, how, how some of the predators will uh, kill their prey is they take the ones that are separated from the herd. Have you ever seen a bait ball? I wish I had a little video to show you, but like when the, when the predator fish come in after like the sardines or whatever the bait fish are, they form this ball and they swim in a circle really fast in this ball so that the fish can't get to any particular, the predator can't get to any particular prey until one pops off on the outside and they're on them like a hungry lion on a piece of pork. It separates us, and by separating us, it gives Satan a foothold into what we do. How about medical knowledge? The Human Genome Project uh, began in 1990. Does everybody know what that is? The idea was to map the entire genome, which is all of the, the genetic structure um, within the DNA of a human being. That's what the whole idea was. They wanted to be able to map the entire human genetic uh, structure, right? In 2003, they finished it. So for the last 21 years, um, we have been able to identify um, the entire set of genetic information in the human being. It has all the information that the human needs to function, uh, and develop, including genes um, for code for proteins and RNA molecules. Um, it, it's, it's an amazing, in fact, when, when I um, have attended the, what these American Statistical Association meetings that I've gone to, a good part of a lot of the statistical uh, research now that's being done has been done in the areas of genetic research and of helping to build this. It's amazing. Pharmaceuticals are being designed based on this uh, project. So what they're determining is that, you know how sometimes like chemo will work for one patient, but they don't work for another. And now they're saying it's based on their genetic makeup. So they're starting to look at that. Not a lot of good comes out of this, guys. The COVID vaccine, um, I'll have to be careful what I say here. We won't be able to have this on YouTube. Um, but the COVID vaccine, the development of it was to a great degree based on this information and knowledge that they have of this um, uh, project, of this ability to be able to map uh, genetically the human, uh, the human being. Medical imaging, we have CAT scans, MRIs, and PET scans. And they actually allow us to see inside of the human body. So 
probably most anyone here who's had surgery on some part of their body now requires a CAT, a PET, um, or an MRI first so that they can image what's inside to see what the problem is before they bother to go in. In fact, sometimes they do, um, they do um, an x-ray guided procedures where the x-ray is live and as they place the needle in, uh, they'll use that to guide it into the right place. Robotic surgery, even though it's been around since the 1990s, uh, it's now being used to reduce the cost and to shorten hospital stays by standardizing the way surgeries are done. Think of the game Operation. How many of you played that game, right? Oh, yeah. So, you know, we get better and better at it. Not touching the side. Eh, that patient's dead. Eh, that patient's dead. Removing all the different parts of their body, right? It was that little battery and the tweezers were connected to a wire. But take a look at this. In 1950, our medical knowledge doubled every 50 years. Now it doubles every 73 days. So you see the compression, the, the sort of geometric compression of knowledge and how it's, it's continuing to increase, just like in the prophecy of Daniel 12.4. There's also an information explosion that's going on uh, in data generation. We have an exponential growth in data production and storage, and that's based on this digitalization. I remember seeing a picture, it was from like 1960 or 70 or something, of a, five, um, a 5K or 10K storage device that they brought out of a plane on a big forklift and it was half the size of this room. When I, I was, was um, um, trained on a DEC, a Digital Equipment Corporation, PDP-10, a computer that had no monitors, that was driven by tape. It was on the second floor of the computer lab or the computer building at the university I went to. Kept it, it was 50 degrees, they had to keep the temperatures down. It took up the entire floor just about of the building. And the only way you could communicate with it was through a terminal that had punch cards. Anybody remember punch cards? Yeah. Uh, slide rules, right, how we did our calculation. And then the next year they got a PDP-11 that basically just answered the phone for the PDP-10. Um, and I think about the growth the, the, the expansion of the information uh, technology that we have today. We have big data analytics, right? D uh, we use it to drive decision-making in business. In healthcare and government, we use it to simulate wars, to simulate diseases. When uh, COVID came out, they were doing simulations of how it would spread um, by using those knowledge sharing. We have Wikipedia, online journals, open source projects, right? AI open source. Uh, I met someone uh, when I, I went to a, a funeral for a friend of mine and his sister works in France with a startup company that has an open source AI platform. And there's generative AI, which is machine learning that's used to create new data. So what machine learning does is it goes beyond the existing data that we have and it predicts into the future and it begins to design algorithms um, by learning about its environment and the things that go on um, around it. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? It's almost breathtaking. It's exhausting, I can tell you that. Uh, I know I have friends who work in the technology realm and uh, it's exhausting for them. I was recently at, um, at a meeting for the new company that bought our, our software and, and we met at this particular location at their main offices and the entire time we were there, all day on um, Tuesday and all day on Wednesday, their internet was down <laughs> and nobody in the company could work. And they were all sent home because nothing would happen. And on, on Thursday, it was still down and on Friday, they finally got it fixed. And they said next week people can start to come back to the office and work. 
Um, things like Zoom and Microsoft Teams and Google, whatever it's called. And, and now people don't have to come to church anymore, right? Because we've trained an entire generation that you don't have to be physically present to learn, to participate, to be a part of. And once again, what does it help? What has this information explosion done? It's helped to separate us from each other, to drive us farther apart, to give Satan a foothold to attack us because we're alone or we're not surrounded by the saints that we need to be. All right, is it always a bad thing? Increase in knowledge and travel and going to and fro, is it always a bad thing? No, it's not. In fact, Proverbs 2.6 says, For the Lord grants wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So the knowledge of the Lord, the travel that we do in order to spread the gospel message, those are not bad things that are being done. But remember, in Daniel 12, 4, or in Daniel 12, 1 through 4, when it talks about this, what it's talking about is people are, in Amos actually, people are out and they're doing this because they're looking for some answers. They're empty in their spiritual lives and they're looking for food and they're not finding it here. So they think if they go somewhere else, but it's not there. It's here. Here and here. That's where we find the spiritual food. Proverbs 1.5 says, let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance. Hosea 4.6, I love this, says, my people are destroyed for lack of what? For lack of knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Wikipedia? <laughs> Answers to what's the, the largest peaks on all knowledge seven continents? What is it? Knowledge of, the knowledge of the Word of God. That's right. Because you have rejected knowledge. What knowledge? Knowledge of the Word of God. He says, I will also reject you, that you will not be a priest to me. Seeing you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Ouch. Miss White says in the great controversy, there will be an increase of knowledge on every subject. Men will seek earnestly for the knowledge of God and those who seek in sincerity will what? Will find it. There's the good news. You don't have to go to chat GPT or Grammarly or any of these other generative AI platforms in order to find the Word of God. It's, well, I'll say it's right here <laughs> in my online Bible or my on-the-phone app Bible, but it's here in the book that is the inspired writings of God. Many will be purified, made white, and tried. So this expansion is not such a bad thing. But here's the problem. We have to be able to define the differences in knowledge and, um, and wisdom, right, intelligence, because those are all different areas. And without discernment, we can't do it. We have to pray for discernment. What's the difference between wisdom and intelligence? <laughs> right? Intelligence is knowing that a tomato is a fruit and not a vegetable. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. Okay? There's a difference. There's our ability to be able to process the information so that we are reasonable and logical, and that wisdom comes from where? God. It comes from God. That's what discernment is. I don't know. Um, there are people I know. Susan has the gift of discernment. I can tell you that. Right? I don't have the gift of discernment. Gets me in trouble all the time. <laughs> Susan will say to me, hey, this might not be a person you want to work with. And if I don't listen to her, there are consequences to that. She can discern those things. Not everybody has the gift, but we can all pray for discernment in a situation and ask God to help us separate knowledge from wisdom. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15 says, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. So what are they getting? They're getting they're getting information of the world. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Now, 
I'm going to get to this in a minute, but I want you to go back and remember in Daniel 12, 4, that he's told to seal this up, that it's a secret, to seal it till the end of time. And why is that? Because they weren't ready yet to hear that message. And there are people today who are still not ready to hear that. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. In the Councils to Parents, Teachers and Students, page 363, Ellen White writes this. We are living in an age of scientific research. The work of investigation is constantly extending. It embraces the heavens and penetrates the earth. The, truth with the truths which we must bring into our lives are grand, yet simple, and of the utmost importance. It is the ignorance of these grand truths that hinders the spiritual growth of thousands. Right? The difference between easy and simple. The gospel message is simple. Jesus Christ is the son of the creator of this universe who came here to this earth to bring us a new covenant that we might live life and live it abundantly yes. and that he, he went and voluntarily committed himself to death on the cross and was resurrected three days later and is now in heaven preparing a place for us so that we will join him and be with him for eternity. That is a pretty simple concept, but it's not easy because this world is in constant conflict with that gospel message. We are being pulled from all sides. So why did Daniel, why was he instructed to shut up the words and to seal the book? And that's because they were not ready at that time for the full understanding of what those prophecies meant. Mark 4.22 says, For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. So this book was not to be sealed forever. It wasn't a secret that just Daniel had, right? It was a secret that he was supposed to hold on to, and that it wasn't supposed to be revealed until the end of time. So it's been revealed now, hasn't it? What does that mean? <coughs> the prophecy has been made clear to us. What does that mean? That it must be the end of time. My dad used to say, it'll all be okay in the end. So if it's not okay, it's just not the end. You just got to hang on and wait. Daniel 12, 8 to 9, if we read further on, says, I heard what he said, but I did not understand what he meant. So I asked, how will all this finally end, my Lord? But he said, go now, Daniel, for what I have said is kept secret and sealed until the end of time. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So it's not always for us to understand everything that we see. What we are, to, we are led by... Um, by sight, or not by sight. We are led by faith and not by sight. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? So it's not about that we can understand everything. We just have to have faith in the Lord that those things will be revealed to each of us individually when we are ready to hear it. Are we spiritually prepared? Well, we have to seek godly wisdom, number one. James 1, 5 says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. I know people that will say, well, you know, I don't want to ask God for that because I don't know if that will make him angry. If you ask for wisdom, it says God will not rebuke you for that. We have to focus on eternal values, those things that we need in order to take with us into the kingdom of heaven. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your mind on things above, not on the things of earth. We have to get involved in evangelism. I saw this big time at ASI. Um, Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. At, at ASI, we met this young lady who's uh, a missionary, and, and she was in this ministry in this foreign land, and, and she was physically abused and beaten. And uh, she told us a story, and she was in tears, and <laughs> we were near in tears. And you know what she wanted? She wanted support so she could go back to that same place and continue her ministry to the people for whom she started it. And I'm like, 
dude, no way. They're going to beat me and abuse me. I'm not going back. But she said it wasn't the people that I'm ministering to that did it. It was the government and the people aligned with that that did it. And and she's on her way back. I, I got a, a text from her on Signal the other day or yesterday just saying how grateful she is for the prayers and the support. And she's on her way back to this country. We also then have to put on the spiritual armor of God. Ephesians 6.11 says, put on the whole armor of God. Because otherwise we have an Achilles heel. You know where that came from? The, the whole history of what is an Achilles heel? How did that saying even come about? Do you know? Because in those days, in, in Achilles was the this sort of um, great um, fighter. Um, um, Tim, you'd have to help me on whether he was. This was during the Trojan War. Right, he was Roman. No, he, this was Greek. Greek, that's right. He was Greek. And he had the full, they had the full body armor and the chain mail and the head guards and the face. But there was one place where they could not cover because they needed to flex their feet and to move. And it was that space behind the ankle where the Achilles tendon is, they call it. And in order to, to defeat your enemy, they took the sword and they would slice that Achilles tendon. And so the person could no longer walk or move. Well, the story for him is that, according to Greek mythology, he was dipped in the river Styx, which gave him invincibility. Right. So he was able to kill everyone, but the only part that couldn't get dipped <laughs> was his heel. Ankle. That's right. And so he took an arrow there and that finished him. That's right. And when the soldiers would fight, that was the only part of their bodies that they could not wholly protect because they, of the flexibility of that part of the foot. In conclusion, Doris. Testimony to ministers and gospel workers, page 114. In the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. Here is the complement of the book of Daniel. One is a prophecy the other a revelation. The book that was sealed is not the revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel relating to the last days. The angel commanded, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. It was, the, it was at the time of the end that the book was to be unsealed and many were to run to and fro and knowledge was to be increased. Amen? Doris? Thank you.